Good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's mission status briefing on flight day six of Discovery's final mission to the International Space Station. A busy day in orbit and here on the ground and with us today to discuss all of those activities are David Korth, the ISS Orbit One Flight Director for STS-133 ULF-5, and Kenny Todd, the Mission Integration and Operations Manager for the International Space Station Program and the Chairman of the ISS Mission Management Team. And we'll start off with David. All right, good day to everyone. Um, orbiter status, uh, everything's looking really well with the orbiter. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of days about uh, can we add a day to the mission or not, and the, uh, the management team decided yesterday that indeed we will be adding a day to the uh, docked mission. Um, we're gonna focus on PMM outfitting, and I'm happy to say the PMM is now part of the International Space Station. Uh, we were actually fortunate enough uh, right around the time that we were bolting, putting final, final bolting in place, uh, we passed over a tour in Italy. So it was kind of a poetic, poetic justice for PMM. Um, right now on the, uh, the overall mission, we're about 60% complete with the uh, physical item transfer. Uh, as far as the uh, duration of the mission, we're, we're calling it a 12 plus one plus two mission at this point, O2 limited. Uh, we still have a, a lot more margin, so uh, folks are still discussing uh, how we want to make use of that for the rest of the mission. Uh, from today's timeline, the uh, as you probably know, and, and I was fortunate enough, the, we all got uh, supported the crew in getting ahead on the plan. Uh, the PMM is installed and is part of the station. Um, the crew is working now on the initial uh, vestibule outfitting and pressurization uh, with the intent of the uh, hatch opening and ingress uh, later this evening, Houston time. Um, per the, the nominal timeline, if you will, it would have been about 5.58 p.m., but uh, we're optimistic that will happen a little sooner. Uh, we had great support today on orbit uh, from a variety of people on, on the, uh, the arm, uh, Mike Barrett, Nicole Stott, uh, using the SSRMS to uh, grapple the PMM in the payload bay, bring it out, berth it to ISS. Uh, Katie and Eric Bowe working the CBM ops to uh, get us through bolting, uh, our ground control team uh, to take care of the final bolting and, and seal the interface up, and then uh, Katie and Mike Barrett uh, ungrapple the arm and put it in position for EVA2 tomorrow, and that all went really well. Um, in the background, uh, so to speak, in the background, the, the Russian team is working hard on the, uh, the replacement of the Vosduk system, their CO2 scrubbing system. Uh, that seems to be going well on plan. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, tonight we'll be uh, obviously getting ready for EVA number two tomorrow. Uh, camp out begins at 7.33 p.m. local, or uh, GMT 60 days, zero, one hours, 33 minutes uh, is when we begin the O2 uh, 10-2 pressurization. <clears throat> uh, hygiene break tomorrow, 5.03 local AM. Uh, GMT, 61, uh, 61 days, 11 hours, three minutes. Uh, egress is targeted for uh, 9.23 AM tomorrow, local Houston time. A uh, GMT of 61 days, 15 hours, 23 minutes, with an ingress at 21 hours, 43 minutes GMT, around 3.43 PM. Number of different activities we have on the plan tomorrow. Uh, for the EVA, we've accomplished all uh, what we call the high, high priority objectives. Uh, one of the first things we'll do is uh, on the EVA is the uh, ammonia venting from the, uh, the pump module that's on the uh, ESP2. Um, and then we'll work off a number of other uh, items. Uh, in parallel with that, uh, we're gonna begin the PMM unpacking. And uh, a couple of the, the main things we're trying to get to tomorrow is a uh, data cable that we wanna get out of the PMM to uh, provide a data connection into the ISS directly, hard, hardwired data connection to the HTV, which is on the node two Zenith. And we've been operating with an RF link between HTV and the US elements, so we're, we're looking forward to that hardline connection. Uh, and of course, the next thing is uh, we'll be taking a lot of trash, or packing trash, a lot of items that came up in the PMM uh, have a lot of uh, packing material structure to protect it for its uh, ascent loads. So we're gonna take that out, throw it in a HTV, and we're gonna move the, uh, the Robonaut block. We're gonna take its packing foam off, and you'll get this big, large metal box 
that uh, houses Robonaut. Uh, we'll be putting that in the lab for unpacking uh, at a future date. Um, beyond that, uh, mission is going really well. Uh, like I mentioned, we're ahead of the timeline again today. Uh, we're looking forward to a successful EVA2 tomorrow and, of course, successful ingress this evening into the uh, PMM. Uh, that's, that's really all I had at this time, so if you want, I can take questions now. Actually, we'll go on to Kenny first, then we'll take questions here. Kenny? Okay, well, it's uh, great to be here with you today. Uh, we had the EVA yesterday. Everything went really well. They got us in a good position, uh, the ops team and the crew did, to go do the, the PMM install uh, this morning. Uh, that all went very well. Congratulations to, to both the crew and, and the ops team. Uh, look very much forward to getting into the PMM uh, later this afternoon, early this evening, and get about the uh, task of, of integrating that, that uh, new module into the living space uh, on board the space station. Uh, then we turn the corner, we go, as Dave said, do the EVA tomorrow. Uh, we got a lot of what I would call kind of cats and dogs on that, on that EVA, things that we've been uh, tracking that we needed to get done for some time. So, Got a good opportunity to go get those tomorrow, and so uh, we uh, we feel good about where we are there. Uh, from a program perspective, uh, as most of you know, we're in the, what I'd term kind of a, a detailed choreography right now of, of vehicles coming to and from the space station. Uh, if you're keeping a, a scorecard, we had the HTV uh, get here at the end of January. Uh, we had the ATV uh, show up last week, and then this past weekend, our, our shuttle friends uh, came for a visit. Uh, we're very much happy to have all those vehicles. Uh, and when you look forward, uh, Scott Kelly and, and his uh, Soyuz crew um, with, uh, with Sasha and Oleg, they'll be returning here in a couple of weeks uh, on, the, on the 16th of March. And then uh, towards the end of March, we'll, uh, we'll uh, let the uh, HTV uh, go. And then, uh, and then we'll look forward uh, a couple of weeks after that to the ULF-6 mission. So as you can see, we're right in the middle of, of what's, uh, again, a pretty, uh, a pretty um, uh, large number of vehicles coming to and from station. And so uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, getting ready to receive those vehicles and getting ready for them to depart. And, uh, and uh, as David said, we got a lot of work relative to configuring the PMM, uh, unpacking it, uh, and getting it uh, ready to receive additional cargo from around the station. And, uh, and we want to make sure that as we go through that, that we, we don't uh, compromise our ability to continue uh, doing uh, human research program type activities, things that, that uh, you know, we're, we're put on station to do. And so uh, with that in mind, um, I went to the uh, shuttle program yesterday and uh, asked them to consider uh, adding a plus one day for us. Uh, again, every time we have a shuttle visit, uh, if we can take advantage of the of the extra crew members, um, we uh, we certainly want to do that. Uh, Leroy and the MMT uh, considered that proposal and agreed uh, to stay an extra day, and so we're uh, we're very happy uh, to have them stay. Again, with the focus being on trying to to get the PMM in a good configuration um, uh, as quick as we can. Um, another task that we looked at uh, for use in this plus one day is what uh, what everybody refers to as this Soyuz flyabout. We, uh, we asked the partnership to uh, consider this possibility. Uh, we, uh, we started this uh, a couple of weeks ago. We, we identified all the forward work through the different partners that they had to go do to assess their readiness uh, from a partner standpoint. Uh, we tracked that work through the, the ISS mission management team and, um, and all the partners uh, were doing their due diligence, um, going through their normal um, uh, management processes that allow them to identify risk and uh, and do what they can to uh, to get those risks mitigated and, and get them uh, uh, get them put to, to bed and uh, so that process has been going on for the last um, uh, week to two weeks um, this morning uh, at this this morning's uh, station mission management team meeting we had uh, we had a plan to go do a go no go uh, to go do that soil use fly about. Um, our, uh, our Russian colleagues uh, were first out of the chute this morning and after doing their own due diligence uh, and using their own independent processes within, within the Russian side of the house, uh, they have determined that, uh, that with 24 Soyuz, which is the vehicle we were going to use to do this, this fly around, that uh, they are not in a position to, uh, to recommend doing that, that flyabout. 
And uh, their primary basis for it was, was because uh, this particular vehicle is what they consider to be a new vehicle. It's what we call a Series 700 vehicle. And so uh, this is its maiden flight. They had a uh, flight program set aside for that particular vehicle, which had it coming to station, uh, serving its uh, six-month term there, and then returning. And, uh, and so um, basically with, uh, with when we asked this, uh, them to take a look at this request um, and the amount of time they had to look at it uh, and, and the fact that they didn't have, uh, before this vehicle was launched, an opportunity to go work this maneuver through their normal development and test uh, planning, uh, given that it's, a, again, a new vehicle, uh, they, uh, they came back to us and said they'd recommend not doing it. And from a, a mission management team perspective, um, we knew all along that, that uh, you know, it was critical for all partners to be able to, to, uh, to go through their own processes and to uh, get comfortable with doing this activity. And, and when we got that feedback from the Russians this morning, um, it, it wasn't necessarily what we, we were hoping to get back, but uh, at the same point, you know, I applaud the Russians um, for doing the right thing, uh, you know, not, to, not to, um, disregarding their own processes, but instead uh, making sure that, uh, that they do their due diligence uh, the way they should and, uh, and, and uh, bringing that back to the partnership. And so uh, I accepted their recommendation. Um, I uh, opened that up for comments to the entire mission management team, and, uh, and it was unanimous. Uh, there were no, no dissenting opinions to the Russian recommendation. Uh, we, uh, we all placed a, a great amount of uh, faith in the system that the Russians have to go make this decision on their side. And so as a, uh, as a mission management team, I, uh, I ask that uh, we cease all uh, further activities with regard to discussions about a flyabout. Um, I think in, in some ways this will allow the team now to get on with the rest of the mission. Uh, everything we can take off their plate is a good thing. It allows them to stay focused on, on trying to get the things done that we need to do. Uh, that we had laid out for this mission for, for the last couple of years. And, uh, and I'm happy to say I feel good about where we're at right now, and, and uh, I think it was a good decision this morning, and, uh, and I look forward to a, a, a good, uh, successful conclusion to this dock to mission with the shuttle guys, and, and we'll, uh, we'll be ready to go do these uh, next set of, of vehicle operations that I mentioned earlier. And uh, that's all I have, unless you have any questions. Okay, thanks, Kenny. Uh, we'll take questions here in Houston. We also have reporters at the Kennedy Space Center and on our phone bridge. So we'll start here in the back with Mark. Oh, thank you, uh, Mark Corot for uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. And I had a couple questions for uh, for Ken Todd. Can can you offer us sort of any new context on how the proposal for the for the flyabout and the picture uh, came about, whether it was a proposal just from NASA or from three of the four of the major partners. Um, and would you foresee any occasion where this might be possible to do again, where you have worked with the other part? I know the shuttle probably, you know, has a couple more occasions to come to the station. I just wonder if this is, uh, gone or whether it might work into a future flight plan. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. So how it came about. Well, I will tell you as a as an IMMT chairman, uh, we were asked to go look at it. Um, uh, certainly to me it came through the through the NASA channels. Um, as we uh, began discussing this with the partnership, I will tell you there was broad support. Um, our Russian colleagues um, uh, worked very hard over the last couple of weeks to uh, to build a plan and to work it within their own system to uh, to see if they could uh, uh, you know get to the point where everybody was comfortable in the Russian um, segment world. Uh, the Europeans again very supportive. Our JAXA colleagues very supportive as well as our Canadian uh, partners. So uh, again, I think across the board. Um, uh, I don't know exactly where it came from, how it came to us, but I can tell you this, in the discussions that we had uh, with the entire partnership, there was very broad support for doing this. Uh, I, th I think in general the community, community thought this was a really great thing to go do if we could go do it. Um, as far as future possibilities, uh, the choreo choreography I talked about earlier, uh, if you look at ULF-6, Clearly, uh, the HTV will be gone by that time. And so um, I think where we're at today, if you look at the flight program and the way it's, uh, if it plays out the way it's laid out today, uh, we won't have um, the, uh, the same number of visiting vehicles. 
And, and so whether that, uh, again, um, we would want to take advantage of that as something we'll have to go, to go look at. Uh, to be perfectly frank, we didn't know we would be here. When we, we put the shuttle plan in place, you know, uh, a year or so ago, you know, we didn't realize that we weren't going to fly in November and we'd end up in February. So um, how that looks going forward, you know, you never say never. But I would tell you right now, the way we have the flight program laid out, uh, this, is a, this is a unique opportunity that, that we had during this particular shuttle mission. Bill? Uh, Bill Hart with CBS. Was, uh, I just want to make sure I understand with the HTV there. I mean, my understanding, if you're coming off the Poisk module and stuff, that HTV provided some shielding, I guess, from pluming, and you couldn't use another Soyuz for that. I mean, that was the only one that was available was, this, was the O1M vehicle. Yeah, see, the, the issue that we have, the only other place we have the Soyuz right now is down on the FGB uh, Nader side. And uh, the issue that we had um, with, with that is there's a, a, um, a cone that we try to protect uh, leaving the FGB Nader. Uh, in fact, it, it, when we depart any port, we have a, an understanding of what the, what the worst case dispersions might be with the departure and, and try to make sure that we have good clearance. And with the shuttle uh, docked, um, uh, to the PMA-2, uh, the tail actually protrudes into that cone that we like to protect. So in general, uh, we don't want to uh, compromise. Uh, and I would tell you at this point, we don't want to compromise on, on that, that cone and, and as those clearances. And so, so we don't really look at FGB Nader as, a, as an option at this point. Um, that is a, a Series 200 vehicle that's there. Uh, the other thing that we have to consider is that that's the, uh, that's the newest vehicle that, that's arrived to station with that crew. And so, uh, you know, again, uh, part of the job uh, uh, that we have to go do is we have to look at all the what ifs and, and what if you undocked this guy and, and couldn't get him back, then you, you know, then, you know, you brought your, your newest crew home. And so, again, that, that all weighs into it. But I would tell you the primary reason we won't do anything with an FGB Nader location is because of, because of the clearance issue. And just a quick follow then, but sure. the only reason that the O1M vehicle could be used is because HTV is on Harmony Zenith, and that provided you the same effect, I guess, going up. I would, I would tell you right now in the configuration that we're in with HTV on the Zenith and the shuttle where it's at, it provides good blockage. For the for the windows, and so um, again, that if the opportunity were ever arise, or we were to make a decision that we wanted to go attempt this again, and HTV wasn't there, again, what we've got today is a point analysis. We'll basically have to go start over with the configuration and try to understand what it would mean to try to do it in a even a slightly different configuration. Other questions? Pete, over here. Oh, thanks. Pete Spots uh, with the Christian Science Monitor. Um, uh, one of the, as we've been hearing about this uh, th throughout the week, um, uh, one of the uh, rationales was uh, the gathering of engineering data. Doesn't that, is, is that rationale strong enough to, you know, suggest taking another crack at this, uh, you know, at a future time? Or um, is it the alignment of the vehicles on top of that that, that sort of made this the prime um, you know, the prime opportunity to do it. Well, again, I think there was multiple reasons why this was, was going to be a good thing to go do. Uh, and clearly, photo documentation, uh, whether it be used for engineering data or whether it be used for, uh, you know, the, the photograph for the ages is, is, is uh, it doesn't, you know, the, still the configuration is what it is. As far as um, the use of Soyuz in the future to help with uh, capturing engineering related data and, and uh, doing fly around and, and I will tell you we every time we do one of these things we learn a lot uh, not just about the vehicles but about our processes that we use to go do these kinds of activities and so um, uh, though we're not doing the fly about here I would tell you we, we got, a, got a lot of good data uh, both about our ability to go do this kind of, uh, of function uh, not just on the Russian side, but but what it would take on our side to go do it, uh, and and with the rest of the partnership. So, uh, again, I I don't see it as uh, a wasted time, wasted effort, and and uh, if we ever needed to go do something with a soil using and, and capture some additional engineering data related to something that may be going out on outside the vehicle, uh, you know, we'll have to assess that at that time. Yeah. Jeremiah Denise has a question over here. 
Denise Chow with Space.com. A question for Kenneth. Um, you mentioned that this is a unique opportunity that you have here and that given the layout of the flight plan um, moving forward, it probably won't m match up where you have all the visiting vehicles here at the same time. And I know from an operational and risk standpoint, it's a, it makes sense to, to accept the decision, but I was just wondering if you could comment on maybe your disappointment or the disappointment of other of the flight control members. Okay, sure. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is very much a, a, a can-do uh, team, and I'm not talking about the NASA team, I'm not talking about the ops team, I'm talking about the entire partnership. Uh, if you look at um, the last uh, 10, 11 years that we've been operating on orbit, um, this, uh, uh, this team, you know, thrives on challenges. And uh, uh, this was something that, again, we were asked to go take a look at. It was relatively late, it was different than, than what our nominal plan was. And, uh, and the first reaction is, uh, how are we gonna do this? And then everybody steps back, they take a breath, and the next thing you know, here come the options and here come the thoughts. And, and so uh, y you know, people start knocking down the walls and figure out how to, how to uh, make things happen. And again, we do that all in the context of our, of our, uh, our risk management processes that help make sure that, that we're asking all the right questions. And so I think, um, um, even on the Russian side, you know, this is not necessarily uh, what they wanted the outcome to be. Um, and so uh, is there disappointment? Sure. I think so. I, I think that uh, uh, this was going to be something that, that, um, that a lot of us were, were looking to pull off but just because, uh, again, it, it would have been something really, really good for, for, for the program. It would have been good for a, a lot of people to, uh, to have this, this image and, and this, uh, this available. So. Uh, yeah, there's there's a little bit of disappointment, but uh, like I told the team at the MMT this morning, you know, we have to re respect the fact that that uh, uh, you know it's the right thing to go do and ask the hard questions, and sometimes the the hard questions bring about answers that that uh, you know may not be what everybody wants, but it may be the right thing to go do. And and uh, again, I had absolute 100% consensus in the room there. Robert. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, you mentioned, uh, well, this was a, a late decision uh, or a late idea to come forward for the flyabout. Um, and not to play what if, but if there had been more time, if this had been proposed well before Discovery launched, um, do you believe that the partners would have been able to come become comfortable with the idea, or was it simply, was it not a timing issue? I would tell you it's only a timing issue in that, um, that we didn't uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about this before that Soyuz launched. Uh, had it made a difference in the in the um, in the Roscosmos uh, position uh, potentially, if they would have had a chance to know this was out there and that we had this potential to do this, uh, you know, through their own engineering test programs and their 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 train and fly type mentality similar to ours, you know, they may have gotten to the point where. Uh, you know, they would have felt more comfortable with this vehicle doing this. But I, I would tell you at this point, uh, you know, it's a new vehicle. Um, they're, they are just like we are in that they want to be very guarded with the way they do things. And, and we, uh, we, we test our stuff before we fly it. We, we, we test it in a way that, that we intend to use it on orbit. And in this instance, we were, uh, as a partnership, talking about doing something that they hadn't, hadn't tested and done before. So uh, I would tell you that, uh, it wasn't just um, you know a week kind of thing. I think we were probably talking about a much longer period than that um, that we should have been talking about this. And and quite frankly, uh, we wouldn't have had that discussion back then because we didn't know exactly where the shuttle was going to end up. Uh, we again had a, a window of opportunity here that was created with with the shuttle ending up in February. So um, again, it, it is what it is, and and uh, and uh, we'll we move forward from here. Okay, let's go down to the Kennedy Space Center now for questions. Um, hello, Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Um, one fly-around question and then one non-related. Um, for Mr. Todd, uh, was it the fly-around portion itself that was the concern of the Russian engineers or was it the redocking part of it? I'm just wondering what was, what was their concern area of, uh, area of about this whole thing? Sure, Marcia. I, I don't think, um, again, at least the, the level of detail that was given to me wasn't broken down by the profile uh, that this particular part of the profile is what was giving them fits. I, I think in general, uh, it's just this, this idea that, 
that you know we we are going to go um, uh, build a vehicle. There's what we're going to ask it to do. We're going to go train our crews to go do this. And 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 uh, with this first vehicle, there's just some level of of discomfort in straying too far from the plan uh, that they already had in place, and and not having uh, the right amount of time uh, with the vehicle to go to go get comfortable, and and with the crew as well. So. Uh, again, I think I think that uh, what we're dealing with here is just it's a it's a new vehicle. It's got it's got new systems on it, and and so there's some level of of comfort that they need to gain before um, they're going to be willing to entertain these kinds of of uh, options. Um, all right, thank you, and and for um, for Mr. Uh, Korth, uh, when they enter Leonardo later today, will they have the usual protective gear, goggles, um, face masks, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's that's part of our standard protocol for entering any any new vehicle the first time it shows up. And, and uh, even though Leonardo, as it was formerly called, PMM, formerly known as Leonardo, um, has a history, I think it was like seven times we've, we've flown it on the orbiter, uh, it's been reconfigured. Uh, got new MMOD, micrometeoroid protection, other things we've done to it. So for all intents and purposes, it is a new vehicle, so we'll treat it the same way. Okay, I think that's it down at the Kennedy Space Center. We have reporters on the phone bridge, and first up on the phone bridge is Irene Klotz. Thanks very much. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, the first is with the addition of PMM and not including the shuttle's mass, what's the current mass of the space station now? Somewhere around uh, 900,000 pounds, I believe, is the number I heard. Um, thank you. And uh, the, other, the other thing uh, concerning the, the flyabout, um, although uh, the picture won't be the same, is uh, can't you get what engineering data you need um, during the shuttle's fly around before it leaves? Um, is your question, are we still going to do the fly around with the shuttle and get some engineering data there? Oh, certainly. A absolutely. Uh, we, we're going to um, still at least get, get, get the data we would normally capture with, uh, with a shuttle fly around and go do the normal um, post-flight analysis that we would do with that imagery. You bet. Thanks, and uh, I had one other one. The, um, although this uh, brings to uh, the end the USS uh, uh, pressurized modules for station, I believe there's still uh, one or two more coming from Russia. Do you, either of you have any updates on what, um, what might still be coming for a station? Well, uh, there, there's the MLM that's still, still in the queue. Our Russian partners are, are working on it, uh, Irina. That's, that's, that's the only one that I know of that, that uh, they're currently active and working on. I'm, there may be others. I just don't have that information with me here and, uh, and, uh, and potential launch dates and all that. We can, we can certainly try to get that to you, though. Thank you. Okay, next up on the phone bridge, James Dean. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, James Dean from Florida today. Um, Mr. Todd, I, I wonder, you, you've been referring to the Soyuz as a new vehicle. Could you um, discuss at all what is new and different about this particular Soyuz? And are you surprised that that concern wasn't raised much earlier in the process? It seemed like it really came down to last day before all of a sudden that was uh, the, the reason for down. James, um, I will tell you that, that uh, there's some new avionics systems. There's uh, new computers. Uh, associated with this particular Series 700 vehicle, um, as far as as what uh, what this means to us, or as we work through the process, uh, I would tell you in, a, in my initial discussions with the Russians, they brought this up. This this was not new information. There was no surprise uh, to anybody in the entire partnership um, that uh, the Russians were were having these types of discussions. Um, again. It, Every, every day you're working in low Earth orbit is an exercise in risk management. It, it is by nature what we do. And so um, no matter what task is in front of us, we're always asking the what ifs. And, and, uh, and so there's no doubt in my mind that the Russians, as soon as we brought this up, again, started their own uh, discussions internally and, and going through their own risk management process to try to understand uh, what, uh, what level of comfort they could get with this. And they were very open with us about this. Um, and, uh, and we had discussions um, to that regard, but, but um, we, 
uh, and the rest of the partnership uh, really uh, needed to let them conclude their part of the process. That, that needed to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, it is their vehicle. It's, uh, it would have been their commander uh, in performing the function. And so uh, from, from the standpoint of, uh, of it being a surprise, it absolutely was not a surprise. Uh, they needed to go do their, their own internal process, and that just took some amount of time. And, and uh, we just got that conclusion uh, this morning. Okay, thanks. And um, I wondered if, if you might be able just to elaborate a little bit more on how that plus one day will be used, since it seems like transfer is, um, is well on its way and, and ahead of schedule. Um, and uh, finally, also, just if there's any of the uh, EVA cats and dogs that you could uh, specify or, or, or highlight uh, uh, occurring tomorrow that are, um, you know, important activities, but, but just sort of... Uh, uh, activities that they'll be performing. I can say uh, the prime use right now of this, this extra day is going to be uh, outfitting of the, the new PMM. Uh, the current timeline that we had going into the mission really barely got us into the PMM. Uh, got a couple of big items out with the, the intent of gathering as much packing foam and packing structure to throw away in the HTV. That's, that's a big program objective. You know, we got a lot of good stuff out of HTV. Um, and the other objective of HTV was to bring home a lot of the uh, packing trash and that uh, we expected to come up in, on this mission. So adding a day, um, the equipment that's brought up in PMM, uh, there is a tremendous amount of things. It's packed to the gills, and uh, there are many, many, many man crew hours of uh, packing, restow, and uh, reorganization. So adding a day and uh, having more folks to uh, help with that task tremendously helps out the, uh, the station and the stage process. So uh, we're going to intend to use it to uh, help out put a dent in the uh, resto of PMM. Okay, next up, Charles Atkinson. Yes, good evening. Charles Atkinson with uh, SpaceLaunchNews.com and uh, Examiner.com. Um, Mr. Todd, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about Russia is going to keep three cosmonauts on board going into 2012 at least, uh, while the U.S. has two Americans and uh, uh, there's going to be JAXA and uh, ESA vying for that sixth position. As far as an international community, um, what is the... What is the interest in Jackson Europe seeing one of their astronauts staying on board in a more permanent residence? Well, uh, clearly, uh, certainly they have a lot of interest. Uh, I mean, this, this is, again, it's an international space station uh, uh, with, the, with a crew of six. So they definitely um, uh, are wanting their astronauts on board. They have um, utilization uh, objectives for the space station. And, and certainly, um, it's, a, it's a great source of pride. Uh, for for them, if they can have one of their uh, one of their um, uh, civilians aboard, and so uh, uh, you know, clearly they would like to li like to to be aboard and, and doing science uh, for their for their nation. So so uh, there's a great interest in doing that, and that's uh, something that we have to balance as a partnership um, going forward. But does it uh, does it seem to you that uh, Russia may have a more of a controlling stance here? Having three cosmonauts. Well, clearly, again, it's a it's a Russian segment and a and a USOS segment, and uh, those agreements to uh, to split the uh, the crew crew assignments uh, that's been in place for for a very long time. If there's any any thoughts about about changing that, uh, again, that's that's going to be discussions that'll be held uh, at a much higher level for sure. Okay, thank you. And last on the phone bridge, uh, Jim Gardner. Is Jim still there? Okay, we don't hear him. So we'll go back to the Kennedy Space Center. I believe Marsha Dunn has a follow-up. Uh, yes, one follow-up for anyone on the panel. I'm wondering, um, do you have the latest percentage for completion of the space station, both interior and outside? I do not, Marsha. I can get that for you. Um, I meant to get that before I came over here, and I, I just didn't get it. So, but I will. I will run that down for you and make sure Rob has it. Okay. 
think we're back here now for any follow-ups. No follow-ups, so let's close with a couple of programming notes. Uh, we're on Rev E of the mission television schedule. That will be updated as developments warrant throughout the rest of the mission. The current uh, mission TV schedule reflects the extended mission. A series of hometowner media interviews will be seen on NASA television with a variety of crew members at 3.23 p.m. Central Time today. That'll be with King TV in Seattle, KTRK TV here in Houston, and Como TV in Seattle. The crew's initial entry into the uh, permanent multipurpose module, as you heard, will be later this afternoon, planned just before 6 p.m. Central Time today, perhaps a bit earlier than that. And the crew's sleep period begins at 8.23 p.m. Central Time this evening, just before the first airing of our flight day highlights at 9 p.m. Central Time, those highlights to be replayed every hour on the hour throughout the course of the night. The ISS Orbit 3 flight director, Chris Edelin, will provide his update on planning activities from console early Wednesday morning at 2.40 a.m. Central Time and the wake-up call for the crew to begin flight day 7 and preparations for the second spacewalk of the flight is set for 4.23 a.m. Central Time tomorrow morning. You can follow all the activities on both the shuttle and the station side of the house on our website at www.nasa.gov. With that, we'll call it a briefing and go back to mission coverage. Thanks very much.